make sure your vote counts. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to John first because he's and besides it's just my brother's spaghetti sauce. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm John Rebatch. I have a Chinese pager, by the way, Bell Um I'm gonna give it to you as a present. So get an American, I'm gonna get an American John, we can't hear you. Okay, I just gave her my Chinese badge. It doesn't work, it fell apart. So I'm asking for an American badge. Uh, the reason I'm here, again, is uh, I just want to remind you that our, uh, the old Springfield Township, uh, you know, Democratic Club, which is called the North Central Club now, uh, is uh, having their annual spaghetti dinner this Thursday at the Senior Center in Springfield Township, which is at the corner of Compton and Winton Roots. And the senior center is in behind the administration area. It's at six o'clock. It's a great, it's a fantastic dinner. I mean, all the, pe all the people make the dinner and there's uh, just fantastic sauces. It's a whole schmear and then of course we have a lot of fun. So it's $20 for adults, uh, 10 bucks for kids. Uh, it starts at 6 o'clock this Thursday, and I have tickets here if you'd like to. Uh, thank you. Uh, she's just taking two or three tickets from me. Yeah, you need any more? No, three. Okay, well, it's 20 bucks. You can pay. I have the tickets here if you'd like to get a ticket or donate. If you can't make it, you could donate because all the funds go to the uh, local, our local Democratic candidates. Okay, so that's a fundraiser. Uh, for our pack, and uh, and if you can't, if you don't have twenty bucks with you, um, you can pay at the door. Thanks. Get there early because Stanley's spaghetti sauce runs out real fast. <laughs> Italian sausage and meat, and uh, it, people know his name there, and they just it just get gobbled up. And I'm bringing a Costco chocolate cake. So um, we're looking at, for that for a dessert. It's one of the best cakes in the city. Other announcements? Um, a couple announcements here since I have the mic, I get to do it first. <laughs> Sunday at uh, Prospect Baptist Church on Section Road is going to be a uh, Cincinnati City Council Forum. And it's going to be hosted by Amos, which is Justice, and uh, the Ur Urban League. The, the focus of this is something I think all of us need to pay attention to. It's about equity and equal opportunity for all citizens of Cincinnati and how these folks that are running for city council want to address poverty, police brutality, all the issues, and that Amos and Urban League are going to be focusing all of the questions around equity and equal opportunity. So I think it's really important to be there. What time, Kate? Uh, six till eight. Uh, at the end of the month, on October 28th, Sherrod Brown will be in town, and he's having a fundraiser from 2.30 until 6 at 50 West Brewing Company, right there on Wooster Pike in uh, the area between Marymont and Terrace Park. He is under huge attack. He is one of the best senators that we have. We always know that he goes in the way he's supposed to go. He is reachable. And um, I know there are other comments. People have other opinions, and that's perfectly fine. But uh, he's going to be there. Fundraiser, friends are $20. Uh, supporters are $50. So that's on the 28th at 50 West Brewing. Sherrod Brown was in the New York Times this weekend as a possible candidate for the 2020. Uh, President. Yeah, President 2020. And, I, and I've got one more thing here. Uh, last November, when I stood at the God's Bible School for from the start of voting to the end of voting, I worked and worked and worked to get Issue 44 passed, the school levy passed. And during that time, I met an incredible amount of people. I mean, uh, AFTAB came and he brought food to the kids that were working there. It was pretty, pretty amazing. But one of the people that was with me for quite a few hours was Christine Fisher. And I got to know her, and that's when I first heard that she was running for school board. So I would like to introduce you to Christine Fisher. Yeah! Yay. Thank you. So I'm Christine Fisher, and I'm running for Cincinnati School Board. Um, 
Do I get a couple minutes, or should I just say that? Uh, I'll just give you my 30 seconds. Elevator speech. Yeah, is uh, I've been at Procter & Gamble for 12 years in finance, and I'm a mom of two young boys. My oldest will start kindergarten next fall, so I have a personal vested interest in our schools and want to bring some of my business experience to the board. Happy to stick around for questions afterwards, and some of my materials are on the, the table up front. So the judge has to leave, but she can stay and answer any questions. She is a child of educators. Make sure you understand that. She comes from an education background. She's 35, even though she looks 12. <laughs> is that her mother? Yeah. <laughs> Robert Sturdivant. Assistant Educational Justice Coalition. Uh, your she's, button, you come on, get your button. Uh, my button got wet and it got smeared, so. I'll make you another button. We'll get another one. Get Jughead on there. Um, <laughs> Shakespeare said, Brevity be the soul of wit. So um, this Thursday, the Assistant Educational Justice Coalition will meet at the Cincinnati Fire Museum, 315 West Court Street at 6 o'clock. Our monthly meeting, the second Thursday of every month. This Saturday, we will be canvassing for Michelle Dillingham, and I've uh, told Christine that we'll take some of her uh, literature. So if you're interested in canvassing, get with me before I leave. It's always a fun time. It's only a couple hours. It's not that bad. Um, a week from uh, tomorrow on the 18th at the Marison Academy, well, the Board of Education, a part of a um, alliance that's uh, the primary sponsor is the Women's League of Voters. And we are going to have a uh, meet the candidate candidate forum for the 13 people who are running for the board of edu board of education. It's going to be a little bit different. People might want to see it. Um, we're going to have tables where people will sit about seven or eight to a table, and the candidates will move after every question, kind of like speed dating for the candidates. So, so I, we encourage everybody to show up for that. If I understand it correctly, that'll be at 5:30. The long-awaited uh, Assistant Educational Justice Coalition report card for Board of Education candidates will be available at this next meeting. We'll have the meeting on Thursday, and that will be formally approved by our group. And I'd just like to say I'd love to see this group. I, I wouldn't have anything to do on Tuesday. I love the company. Thanks. Um, while we're talking education, I want to mention that uh, I was at a, uh, a director's meeting for the League of Women Voters, and we endorsed... Um, issue 24 which is the renewal of the levy I just want to make sure that you know that they have met the requirements they're actually requirements for the League of Women Voters to uh, to to endorse something like that they, they had to have improved attendance improved graduation rates and just growing in every category I have one other announcement sorry when she talked about issue 24 at the, I'm sorry, at, at issue 24 at the Letter Carriers Hall at Northside at the corner of Blue Rock and Cole Rain, the white building. We're going to have on uh, today from 3 to 6 and from Thursday from 3 to 6, there will be an opportunity for you to volunteer to help put yard signs together for issue 24. I'm sorry, I forgot that at the first. Uh, I also want to be free pizza. <laughs> Ooh, there you go. Um, get, get those. Get those issue 24 signs all matched up with pizza. That would be good. <laughs> uh, I do want to mention uh, naturalization ceremonies. Um, I was I got so many people from this group to go to naturalization ceremonies with the League of Women Voters. They make me a director. <laughs> I can't help it. Um, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm now an officer of the uh, League of Women Voters. I just want to say that um, this past Friday, we uh, were at the uh, Hamilton County Court House, Hamilton County, whatever it is. I they, you know, All these courthouses confuse me. That's why we have Judge Rucker here today. Um, anyway, we had, there were, we got 54 of 65 new uh, citizens to register to vote and I have to tell you that I re I think the reason why we're not getting all of them to vote is because so many of the people are elderly they don't speak the language they can't fill out the form that they're the what these new citizens are are 
the elderly relatives and parents and you know grandparents or whatever who are being brought in and their families are worried that they're going to be deported. I'm just I'm just concerned that that's why we're seeing a lower than 100% count getting these people registered to vote because we used to get 70 out of 70. Um, anyway. We're doing a great job getting these people registered to vote, and they're going to vote in this election, and you start better getting prepared to do that, too. Uh, any other announcements? Yes, Marlene. Uh, really quick, uh, my daughter's high school, Bader High School, CPS, uh, they are having their annual walkathon, and I am seeking donations for her. Uh, so see me after if you are interested. See the lady with the neon hair. <laughs> she will take your money and have her daughter walk for you. Very Martha. Okay, very quick. Oh, um, this, uh, we're call, a group of us are calling Casey today about Tyra Patterson, the young black woman who's been in jail for 23 years for something she didn't do. Read about her in The Guardian. They ran a three part series on her and they considered her. It's obvious she, she was not an accomplice to murder. She's been granted a hearing, so we need to stay behind the governor right now about that. Thank you, Martha. Any other announcements? Okay, Karen. Look at that smile on Martha's face. I love it. Karen. Hi. You've heard us a couple of times talk about how we are supporting a group called Move to Amend, but we have some changes. First, I want to tell you that we are Move to Amend now. We have officially affiliated. We are going through some training right now. But you know our leadership team. It's my husband, Dick, and I. Yes. Dick, both you. Yes. Deb, yes. Saul, <laughs> Sid, Sid. 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 Sid, and Rob White Weidenfeld. Does Sid have his name tag? Uh, I'm wearing it for him. <laughs> okay. She doesn't have he's one. He's 15 months old and he's our youngest member. So for those of you that haven't heard, our effort is to get big money out of politics. Yes. That is our heart strength. And we truly believe no matter what your biggest issue is, our issue supports your issue because we can't fix education or health care or even human rights until we get big money out of politics. So um, just quickly, here's a little checklist that's over there of things you can do. Here's a nice little brochure that explains the We the People Amendment, which is uh, money is not speech, people, uh, corporations are not people. And um, the 48th, House Joint Resolution 48th now has 44 sponsors. So we encourage you to um, check us out and maybe join our effort. Thank you. Wonderful effort. It comes out of this group. I'm so excited. Um, any other announcements? Dr. Weaver. Yes. Thank you. I just want to say that the campaign is going well. There are now two other candidates who are seeking the nomination for the U.S. House of Representatives in 2018. I am looking forward to a robust race leading to the nomination. I want to emphasize that the Republicans have now really made their intentions clear by their actions, that with the a uh, desire to remove the Affordable Care Act that they are not only uh, put in the desire to remove the expansion of the Affordable Care Act, but the Affordable Care Act itself and also some of the robust provisions of, uh, of Medicaid and the reduction in Medicare as well. And this is emphasized again in the tax relief program which reduces Medicare by $450 billion over 10 years is just a repeat of the affirmation from before and reduction in, uh, in Medicare by $500 billion over 10 years. So the 2018 congressional elections is fundamentally important 
we must take back the House because the amount of political pressure that's being exerted now by the Republican Party, uh, preliminary to 2018, we saved the uh, ACA by one vote in the Senate. That's, that's all that stood between, uh, between what we have and what would happen to the medical system in the United States if, if the Republicans had their way. We must take back the House in 2018. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Other announcements? No. Without, <laughs> without further ado, I'm going to make these very brief. Uh, Judge Fannin Rucker uh, is uh, committed. Fannin, did they say that? I'm sorry. Fanon. No, it's worth having you here for me to pronounce the name right. Fanon Rucker. There you go. Fanon Rucker uh, is a transparent where he wants justice prevailing for all. Seems like a good theme for us. Um, born and raised in Gary, Indiana. But he's a local boy with the University of Cincinnati. I'm going to leave the other introductions. He, he's, he's here for us, folks. And that, that counts for a lot. And we only have like 20 minutes to have him. So let's get to him and make sure we get the board of the Thank you so much. Um, I know that this is the I'm, I'm sorry. I know that this is a meeting of the greatest Cincinnati Democrats, but I'm going to drop the ER and just say good afternoon, great Cincinnati Democrats. It, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that, that, that for 13 years I've been running for office. 10 years I've actually been on the bench. But uh, many of you all, and it's a lot of familiar faces in here, but 13 years ago there was a write in campaign against this dude who was the state treasurer, and that was a write in for prosecutor. And that was my jump into politics. It's hard to believe that that, that race was really, uh, a lot of people said, responsible for changing ultimately the demographics of our county. And we do know that the county is much different demographically than it was in 2004. So it's hard to believe that there's been a good, such good change, but we are continuing to wave in Hamilton County of changing this place to what it should be. And AFTAB is a perfect example of that. Uh, Dr. Odell Owens and Lachmi, uh, Lachmi uh, um, uh, Samarco have been perfect examples of that. And now it's time to change the courthouse and deal with some justice issues. A um, couple of preliminary issues. Um, I, I know there was a mention of the Springfield Township uh, spaghetti dinner coming up Thursday. Uh, I gave it home. My wife is a Springfield Township uh, precinct executive and secretary of the club. So if I didn't also encourage people to attend, I'd get in trouble when I got home. So I'm going to offer that again. Um, tomorrow evening at the Urban League at 6 o'clock, the Cincinnati Bar Association the League of Women Voters and the uh, and the uh, Urban League are having a forum. You all have the flyer called "Who Are You to Judge?" and it's a it's a forum for all of the individuals who are running for judge in Hamilton County this year. I will say that there are two who won't be there, and if we have time, I'll I'll address that issue. I was asked to come today just to talk to you all for a minute, and, and I'm, I'm going to make sure I leave time for questions because I think there's probably more value in, in you all asking me things that you want to know rather than me guessing what it is that you want to hear. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the different levels of court, and, and then I'm going to talk to you about why politics has a role in the courthouse, even though it shouldn't. So I am a Hamilton County Municipal Court judge. Hamilton County Municipal Court is in no uncertain terms the people's court. I average about 50 cases a day, and there are 14 municipal court judges. Once every 14 weeks, our responsibility is to sit in the justice center and arraign people, set bonds on people, decide how much money, if any, they have to pay in order to get out of jail while their case is pending. So you see people getting picked up overnight and they appear in front of the judge wide-eyed and or you know, beat up the next morning, and the judge is sitting there, that's what we have to do once every 14 weeks. And this is my week to do that. Um, and had some, some pretty rough cases um, yesterday and today. 
Um, got a call from my barber saying I need a haircut because he saw me on the news this morning. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I'll be going to make a trip this afternoon. Um, but, but municipal court judges are the most active judges in the state judicial system because about the sheer volume of cases that we have. But we're also the judges that deal most particularly with those constitutional amendments that we all know and that we all claim to love. You know, the Fourth Amendment that said that the police cannot unreasonably search your car or that you cannot be arrested or seized without probable cause or that they can't enter your home. Municipal court deals with those issues daily on a very personal basis. We make decisions on questions raised whether or not the police have the legal authority to enter a house or whether to stop someone in the first place. Below us are magistrates. Now magistrates are appointed positions and they're under judges, meaning their decision doesn't become official until we sign off on it. In municipal court we have, I believe, four municipal court judges. And those judges hear the evictions. They're the first line to hear the evictions. They're the first line. They actually hear the cases of small claims court. They actually set bonds in the afternoon for misdemeanors. But they work for us as judges. And we, as a judicial bench, all 14 of us, appoint them by majority vote. By majority vote. This is where this politic thing comes into play. Now, what are the other levels of court? There are three levels of court in our system in Ohio, but also in the United States court. There's a trial court level where we actually hear testimony and people raise their hands and swear they're going to tell the truth in their lives until they can't see straight. <laughs> That's the first level. And then there's the middle court. It's called the court of appeals or the appellate level. And that's where judges sit in groups of three to look over the decisions that we make as trial court judges. And then there's, of course, the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, on the highest level, oversees and second guesses what the Court of Appeals judges do. Now, at the trial court level, there's juvenile court, there's domestic relations court, and of course deals with divorces and child custody <coughs> issues and child support. There's municipal court, there's common pleas court, and common pleas court deals with drug cases and murders and kidnapping and some of those more serious cases that, that are more rare but that we hear more about on a daily basis. The trial court level is also the probate court, who deals with issues of wills and trusts and probate. And what happens to um, our estates when we pass away, when our families fight over, over those faces that we didn't give to our aunt and stuff like that. But those are the trial court levels. Those are the court levels where things actually happen. And it's single judge courts. So I, in my seat, make a decision on a case. And I could be right or wrong. When someone raises their hand and says, Judge, I object, I have to make an immediate decision whether their objection should be sustained or whether it should be overturned, whether some evidence should come in or whether it shouldn't, whether something that someone says should be stricken from the record and, and not considered by the jury or by me as the judge. When you go to the higher level, to the Court of Appeals, they sit in groups of three because you should have more than one eye to take a look at what the judge did at the court below. And so the three of them argue and discuss whether or not what the trial court judge did at that minute, uh, uh, pinpoint second, was correct or not. And then after the Court of Appeals makes their decision, the Supreme Court it either sits in fives or sevens. Um, five, five here in Ohio actually then oversees the decision from the Courts of Appeal. Now we know in the federal system, there are also three levels, but those judges are appointed. And those are life appointments. Of course, appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. In Ohio, as it is and in many other states, those are elected positions. The municipal court, the trial court judges are elected. The court of appeals judges are elected. And the Supreme Court judges are elected. I actually ran for a Supreme Court five years ago, and I can tell you that running across this state for statewide uh, offices is a very uh, exhausting proposition. Um, but that's another conversation for another day. There's an argument that it doesn't make sense 
for our judges, particularly on those high levels, to be elected. <coughs> what do we, any of us individually know about the ability of a judge to make a reasoned decision about whether someone else did or did not do something correctly? What do we know about the track record of that, ju that judge when they were in private practice? How do we know how many cases they won if they even represented corporations or individuals when they were practicing? We don't. Justice Moyer, who, uh, uh, God rest his soul, was our chief justice for any number of years, about 20 years. And he was very proactive in arguing and creating an effort for judges, at least on the Court of Appeals level and for the Supreme Court, to be appointed. To be appointed by a body, a bipartisan body, of individuals who can actually look at the records and look at the merits of those who are seeking those positions to make decisions about who should be sitting in those seats. Now, unfortunately, Justice Moyer passed away before he could put something in place for that to happen. But those are the different levels, of course. Trial, appellate, and Supreme Court. I personally believe that the trial court is the most exciting court. And, and if you all don't believe me, welcome to come down any day and, and sit in the courtrooms and, and, um, and be I don't want to say entertain because it's people's lives, but it's entertaining. It's really entertaining. It is. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's heart wrenching. Sometimes it's it's a are you serious type of look. Are you, did you just say, are you serious? I mean, we do get that a lot. Um, but it is. It, it, we deal with people's lives, and we and you know one of the things about um, judging. Someone asked me what is power, and. Sitting on the bench, and I was a prosecutor for a number of years before I went into private practice and started practicing civil rights law and employment discrimination law. But, but what I see in the courtroom, the exercise of power is a question of how much authority someone else has over your life. At a traffic stop, the police officer has a great amount of authority. Because that police officer has the discretion to decide whether you get a ticket, whether you go to jail, or whether you live or die. That's power. When you get to the courtroom, the prosecutor is a powerful individual because they decide what charges the judge hears against you. They decide what argument to make against you. That's authority over your life. But the most powerful person in the courtroom is the judge. Every day, I consider the fact that I have the ability to separate people from their homes. I can order somebody not to go back to their own house. I can separate people from their families order them not to be in contact with their children, not to be in contact with the spouse or a mother or some other relative. I can cause someone to lose a job, but I can also encourage someone to get a job. That's a lot of discretionary authority over other people's lives. So as a judge, and that's for non record because I was for non record for a long time before I was a judge, it should be a point of reflection for me and my colleagues, not a job. It should be a mission that in the exercise of power, we exercise that power wisely and in a motivating way. Yeah. In the same way we have the power to separate people from their families and separate them from their jobs and separate them from their houses. We should also seek in the protection of those entities and those individuals to seek ways to keep people from continuing to offend, to keep them from coming back to the court, to find ways to help them see something different than they saw before they got into the problems that brought them to court in the first place. That should be how we exercise our power. And that's kind of what I seek to do every day uh, on the municipal court. So those are the levels of court. Now why is politics involved in the court system? Um, one of the things that I do and I love to do, I study history, I teach history, I've been an adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati teaching history. Um, I, I'm a, uh, a lecturer of historic issues uh, statewide and in other states. And I can tell you a bunch of um, examples historically where even though people said politics had nothing to do with it, it seemed pretty clear that politics had a lot to do with the decisions that were being made, 2000 Bush versus Gore. Uh, United States Supreme Court, perfect example. Um, and there was another one in 1868 where we had a, a national election 
and the Supreme Court ultimately decided that Rutherford B. Hayes would be the president, which caused the Hayes-Tilden compromise, which resulted in all of the gains from the civil rights, excuse me, from the Civil War and, and, and the uh, freedom of, of, uh, of slaves. All those advances were reversed because of this compromise. And that was a decision made by the Supreme Court. Who would actually be in a position to do that? But locally, why does it matter that I'm an endorsed Democrat? Why does it matter that when we run for office, people say, well, who's the endorsed Democrat? Who's the endorsed Republican? It shouldn't matter on a daily basis of the 50 people that come in front of me in my case. When someone says not guilty, the only thing that I should be concerned about is whether or not the state proves this case by proof beyond a reasonable doubt, without regard to party affiliation, without regard to socioeconomic status, without regard to anything other than the state's burden to prove its case. But I'm not just a judge. I'm an administrator. I make hiring decisions. I make policy decisions. So what happens, there are 14 municipal court judges. And, and I'd love to tell you the history about why we have 14 municipal court judges and how our district is broken up and the only system like that in the state of Ohio out of all 88 counties. I'd love to tell you that story when we have some time. But when we go back once a month, we now we do it twice a month, all of the judges sit in a room at something called joint session. Now joint session is where we as judges talk about current issues of the day. We may have someone from Talbot House come in and talk about a new procedure, a new program that they have. We may have people from probation coming in and talking about the way that the electronic monitoring devices should work so we can monitor those who are charged with offenses. But we also in there sign off on hiring for <coughs> positions that the municipal court controls. We also sit in there and talk about policies that our municipal court passes that affect all citizens that exist or that live in Hamilton County or that come through our city or our region. For as long as I have been practicing, that's been 21 years, the Hamilton County Municipal Court has been controlled by a majority of Republicans. So what happens? Well, every year there's an election for the presiding judge. The presiding judge has the authority to decide certain things about what gets on the agenda, of course, but also they have certain signature authority, they have certain relationships with law enforcement, with the prosecutors. Um, it's a, it's a, a somewhat of a, a power position, but not a real power position. And then there's the administrative judge. So if that, any time something happens, they go to the administrative judge. There's an emergency, the administrative judge is the one that they go to, not the rest of us 13. So every year, by majority vote, the Republicans have elected themselves to presiding judge, administrative judge. And then they talk about the succession of who takes over if the presiding judge is not available. And it's always the next Republican judge. It's on, on a piece of paper, I'll show it to you. It's Republican judge, Republican judge, Republican judge, Republican judge, Republican judge. I haven't seen any of our names on there. And then there are committees. We have a finance committee in municipal court. We have a personnel committee on municipal court. We have a legislative committee. We have a research committee. We have a probation committee and a civil committee that actually drafts policies and rules that then go into effect for lawyers as they practice their cases. Who are all the chairs of these committees? Well, the presiding judge decides who is the <laughs> chair of these committees. By relationship, I think I was the first Democrat to actually chair a committee. It was a legislative committee, which, no, research. So I guess you know, I, I didn't, didn't know what I was supposed to do. So I would just come in and say I read a book and you know, read a law, but nobody really paid attention to it. But finance, personnel, all of those are chaired by people in the majority part. This year, we're in a unique position. We have three contested municipal court races. And right now, there are five, six, there are six, I'm sorry, five, there are five, Yates, Mallory, Mallory, Barry, Grant is leaving, Rucker. So there are five, there, will be, there, there are currently uh, six, but there will be five seats. One of those is contested, Judge Grant's seat is contested. 
there are six Democratic judges and eight Republican judges. If we retain Judge Grant's seat and take just one of those other seats, it will no longer be a majority rule. It will now be an even 7-7 split, which means everything now has to be negotiated. Every position, every chairmanship, every job. You know, it's interesting, there was an article in City Beat that talked about the, uh, a few months ago, that talked about the, the um, coincidence that all of the new prosecutors have the same last names as other judges and uh, county <laughs> officials uh, and prosecutor, um, and they all have the same last names. And there's some hiring issues there. Well, when we hire positions for municipal court, interesting that some of the names that we see coming across looking for our signature are the same names as some of those other folks that are in the Republican Party at the courthouse. And those are the names that we're signing off on for hiring positions. And even, even split means that there's no meeting before the meeting. And even, even split means that we all have a say-so in the policies and in the hiring decisions and in ultimately the decisions that impact all of us. So what does, and what should politics have in the day-to-day -day workings of me as a judge and setting bonds and making decisions on cases and in sentencing and deciding what evidence gets in and gets out? It shouldn't. I'll tell you, for me it doesn't. There's a, there's a phrase on the outside of the courthouse that says, what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and love mercy? That's my obligation as a judge, and that's the only thing I love. Okay. Thomas Jefferson said, equal and exact justice to all, no matter station, gender, or politics. That, that, that's my obligation. But we do administrative stuff. And those administrative things impact everybody. Um, perfect example. Last week, um, well, there's a, there's a push right now, and I don't know if you all know this, but right now, jurors are only selected by voter registration rolls. State law says that you can do that. State law also allows for jury pools to be selected from voter registration and a combination of driver's license and uh, state IDs. So what it says in the state law is that at the beginning of every year, the Board of Election and the Registrar of Motor Vehicles sends a compiled list to the jury commissioners and then they begin to pick their jurors from those lists after they combine and make sure there's no duplication. But it's by local rule that you have to bring in driver's licenses and state IDs. We have never accepted that in Hamilton County. We only do it by voter registration. Now, what's the argument to do both? You cast a wider net and you have more juries that are reflective of the community yes, that yes, these people yes. are being tried in. Yes. So, when the rate testing case came up, there was a question about you know, the diversity of the juries and whether or not, in fact, we should and could have more juries that are socioeconomically reflective and racially reflective and gender-wise representative of our community. So I offered a resolution. A resolution saying, hey, the state law says we can include voter registration and state IDs. Even though we don't decide it as municipal court, we try cases. So let's tell the Common Pleas Court that we support an effort to cast a wise net to have the juries that are most reflective of our county. It's just a resolution. We say we support any effort to expand the jury pools to include what the state law says we can. A day before our joint session where this is going to be discussed, I got a visit from the head of the Common Pleas Court, uh, presiding judge. Uh, the Republican judge. Mm -hmm. And she said, For now, I understand that you're about to present a resolution. Now, that's interesting because we have a good relationship, but she don't come see me. <laughs> and, and I was just confused as to why this was getting to her when we hadn't even passed it in our joint session yet. Mm -hmm. So, our presiding judge, who I had asked to put it on our agenda, decided to contact the powers that be to see if they would support this resolution that would be coming from this Democratic judge in our joint session. And I was given a visit to head off the pass. Now, there was, she then showed up at our joint session and had discussion, <coughs> and, and it wasn't endorsed. It was tabled until January. Um, but that was public record. 
and so is the discussion, and so that's what it's going to be, at least from our end. But I have a hunch that if one of my colleagues, who was part of the presiding judge line, had offered this resolution, it would have been on the deck yeah. for our signatures before we got to that meeting, and there would have been little discussion about it because the majority of them would have decided whether or not they were going to support it. We need a 7-7 seven -seven split so that the community can benefit from the negotiation. Important election. If all of them are, but that's why, particularly in municipal court, politics plays a role in what we do. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Uh, I have a friend who had the misfortune get, get of being. Get a mic. Hold on. <coughs> quick, quick. Thank you. I have a friend who had the misfortune of being arrested on a late Friday afternoon and sat in jail for three days uh, prior to the next date for arraignment. Is there any possibility? that uh, an arraignment court can be held seven days a week by rotating judges in order to make fair the, uh, the arraignment process for people who are arrested and at the same time relieve some of the crowding in the jails. Thank you. Um, I'm a bit surprised to hear that it was three days before they were arraigned because we do have arraignment court six days a week. Oh, okay. It was Friday night and they stayed over a three-day weekend. Then they must have got in after the time they could have set for, for the Saturday morning docket. But when we're on duty, um, so on a Saturday or a Sunday, I get calls twice a day, once at 3 o'clock and once at 8 o'clock in the evening to set bonds on people who haven't picked up. Um, there are certain charges that the Supreme Court says you're not supposed to arraign except by personal appearance. Um, and those charges, you do have to personally appear in front of the judge. Is there a possibility of a seven-day arraignment? Yes, but that would be adding one more day. Um, and I, I don't know what would be the downside of that because the fact that people are, this is one of the things that, that I do uh, talk about a lot, is the bond issue. Um, there was a case out of New York of a young gentleman named Khalif Browder. Khalif Browder was arrested for a charge that he did not commit sat in jail on a $3,000 bond. He was 16 years old, sat in Rikers Island at 16 years old yeah. for a year, year and a half, two years, two years. Case kept getting continued and continued and continued. And because his family did not have the financial resources for him to get out of jail, he stayed in there. Solitary confinement months. 16 years old in Rikers. He got out. Charge was dismissed because they found out that the person that accused him of doing whatever it was lied. And the case got completely dismissed because not only was it not guilty, he was innocent. Mm. He ended up committing suicide right. mm. because he couldn't handle the pressure of what he went through for those years. And it raised, a, this is just a couple of years ago, but it raised a national discussion here in Ohio particularly, and there's some things being done here in Hamlin County by several of us to address it, and that is when you're arrested for a charge, you are innocent until proven guilty. But many of the judges act like you're guilty until you're proven innocent. If you're poor. Because I well, I don't know. I may be able to pay a thousand dollars. I may be able to pay a thousand dollars bond. But the majority of people coming through those court systems cannot. And so if they're charged with a theft offense, which is a nonviolent offense, they get a thousand dollar bond just because that's what we think is standard and appropriate. But they can't come up with it. And so they sit in jail, away from their families, away from their homes, away from the hourly job that they have. And they lose all those things. And all of those things are interrupted. And so the question is, what should be the appropriate measure of how much or to what extent should someone have to pay a bond or can they pay a bond in order to get out of jail while their case is pending? Obviously, safety to the public should be primary on people's minds. <coughs> there is a standard bond sheet for certain offenses. Standard bond sheet. Resisting arrest has a standard bond of $2,000. Um, obstruction of official business has a standard bond of $1,000. This is the first offense. If a person lives outside of the county, it's a different bond. But those are standard. If a person is unable to pay those bonds, they sit in jail until they see a judge, and the judge can then decide to lower those from the standard bonds. I don't think there's anything, I'm not, certainly I'm not against a seven day a week um, opportunity for people to be seen by a judge in order to alleviate that. And the overcrowding issue is pretty ridiculous. 
um, and, and some of my colleagues, and I, and I did publicly talk about this as well, were doing this thing where someone would come in front of the judge and say, I'd like a lawyer. And they would get a continuance. And if they came back to court two weeks later, not having gone to the public defender's office or not having taken steps to get a lawyer, they would be arrested in court and then held overnight and brought before a judge and then appointed a lawyer and judge next morning. They didn't commit any new offense. They've already paid their bonds. They have no expectation that they're coming to court to go to jail. They had lives and they were too busy. They had kids. They had other things going on and just didn't get a lawyer between then and now. But you know what? We have the right to waive a lawyer. I don't have to have a lawyer. So I didn't understand why my colleagues were locking people up for something that they could waive. If I don't have to have a lawyer, why am I being locked up because I don't have a lawyer? And there was several, there was about eight of them that were doing it. And unfortunately, there was some of our Democratic colleagues that were doing the same thing. So when it was addressed, it changed. But my question to them was, if the jail's overcrowded, as Sheriff Neal has announced, and we know there's an emergency funding issue, and, and everybody's trying to figure out where people are going, how are you locking people up because they don't have a lawyer on a theft charge or a disorderly conduct charge? Somebody else is getting let out because you're locking somebody up not having committed a new offense. Sometimes we just need to think better about our decisions, and our jails may not be as crowded as they are. But I do believe that um, seven day a week arraignment would be a, would be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because of a car accident, I recently spent a few hours in court, and I was struck by the fact that I was virtually the only white person in both the courts that I was in. Could you just speak generally to the role of race in the justice system in this area? Speak generally, like shortly? <laughs> It's bad. No, um, I, I will say um, I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear that. Um, and, and I say that because when I started off as a prosecutor in 1996, crack cocaine was the prevailing impetus for bringing people to court. Um, not just the possession of the crack cocaine itself, but for theft charges. People stealing from Kroger and Walgreens in order to get the fix. Um, people breaking windows and getting in, in, in fights with their spouses, uh, and so breaking windows and, and domestic violence charges. So, so crack cocaine was a, a primary reason that a lot of people were actually in court. In 2017, you can't find a crack cocaine case with a flashlight. But all you see are heroin cases. Every 80% of my cases probably have something to do with heroin. The worst are the or the DUIs, where people were behind the wheel of cars and running into buildings and running into people and, and, and stopping in Mount Auburn to get their fix from Kentucky, shooting up in their arms and passing out behind the wheel with the needle still stuck in their arm and their child in the back seat. Those are the things that I get. But because of the change in the nature of the charge, there's also been a huge change in the demographic of those who are coming into my courts. I don't have a majority of blacks in my courtroom anymore. Maybe some days there are, but I have a majority of whites in my courtroom. Young, old, um, middle income, lower income, upper income. On heroin, for heroin related offenses. Um, it's something that me and my bailiff actually remarked about, that it, it's, it's, it's majority white now. Like 70 to 70 30. When, when I started the prosecutor, it was most certainly 70 30 the other way. But there are certain exceptions. Obviously, if you come down to any given day, you may see a different, um, a different representation, and perhaps that was your experience that day. But it, it's, um, it's a significant change. And, and I, I, don't, I don't have the time to talk about my, my, uh, my echo sentiment that the way that we're dealing with the heroin epidemic is certainly different because of that change in demographic and the world back then. Just an observation, just an observation. Just an observation. Uh, I'm in favor of change, but you know. <laughs> well, I know the child was in the back seat, just we asked for an armada. Are you serious? Really? That's what that's one of the are you serious case. Um, 
but but it's it's but but the differing way that we deal with race in the system is reflective of the different ways that we deal with race in our society. You know, we we were told by our United States Supreme Court that we live in a colorblind society in 2009. I don't know what society they're talking about because all I heard during the eight years that we had an African American president was not a colorblind society, and I certainly haven't heard in the past year and a half what we hear from our esteemed president in D.C. Uh, his his mixing of stirring of racial pots. So I don't know what colorblind society um, these these uh, educated um, uh, experienced folks are talking about. It may be aspirational, and I hope that that's what we're moving to. But I wouldn't suggest that right now. That's where we are. Yes. Um, I was in the courthouse one day, just walking around because I was waiting for something, and um, I saw somebody in a uh, like a convict suit. It was black and white striped. And I thought, if he has to go before a judge looking like that, that's not good. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they have to have a uh, uniform um, appearance. You know, for a while, um, they kind of, uh, I think when Silas was there, he did what the guy down in Joe Arpaio uh, in Arizona did, put them in pink suits uh, to humiliate them and to denigrate them. Um, but there are cases that say if you're being tried before a jury, you do have the right to have your lawyer bring in a change of clothes so that that's not what the jury sees. They presume that we as judges can put aside the, the inherent bias that may exist with someone in jail clothes and make a decision solely based on the facts and the law. Um, I didn't write that decision. <laughs> but I do believe that um, it, it does present poorly if a person is, you know, standing there in a jail suit and having to argue that they didn't do yeah. what it is they're accused of doing, even right. though they're innocent until they're proven guilty. Yeah. Yes? Last one. Last question. Oh, wow. Um, you said 80% of the cases you're seeing now are heroin related. I assume that all drug related cases probably account for something like 90% of the jail overcrowding. But, um, but you've kind of addressed that. The thing I would like to ask you about is money. You talked about bonding out. What about the other costs of being in court? The costs of transcripts, the costs of an appeal? I mean, it can be prohibitive for a lot of people to appeal a decision. Um, it, it is, and you know, there's this idea of working poor. Um, to make, don't make enough money to, 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 to appeal and to get a good lawyer, but make too much money to get it at no cost. Um, and a lot of people fall within that category. So they come to court and they say, well, I have a job, I'm making however much a year, and that's right above that level where I can be appointed a lawyer by the public defender's office. So now I have to go out and hire a lawyer who's willing to take it at an amount that I can pay for it. And then once I'm found guilty, um, I have to appeal it. Well, I wish I could appeal it and ask for the fees to be waived, but again, I fall right above that line where I can have my fees waived um, and, and that's the working poor issue. If you have enough money for it, it's not an issue. And if you don't make enough money, it's really not an issue because um, those fees can be waived and you can have the representation that you need. But, but for those of us who are on that line, it's, that's where you know, the, uh, the real detriment comes in. Justice. Justice. Is um, what may be done is to raise the bar of what the poverty line is according to the um, uh, qualifications. For those, uh, for those fees to be waived. That would be the best thing, although there would still need to be people above that, but the further you get, the more people are able to take care of those, those costs without it being you know, uh, harmful to them. But that would be the best way, and that's something that the Public Defenders uh, Commission could address. And I, I also have a talk with uh, yes, the Public Defender. Um, I'll write you down, I'll talk to the Public Defender. Yeah. Thank you. Let's hear it for Judge Rucker. Thank you again. You have wonderful questions. I'm glad you're here, but I don't want to keep somebody's marriage from happening. Yeah. 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 Fifteen minutes won't hurt. We got a lot of time to go. Thank you so much for being here. Hold up. It's not over. He's got to go, but we have a, a couple of things. Uh, I have to announce that you need to take food home. 
We have things happening in the future. Next week, Denise Streethouse, our first woman Hamilton County Commissioner. The week after that, we have Pro Kids Casas for by Kathy King. We have good programs coming up. Please come and join us. Sign up for a button if you didn't get one. We really are... My, my American-made machine is working. The Chinese one I've given up on. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Please belly up to our bar. If you don't leave any of the food, we need to get that food taken care of. We don't want to waste any food. Thank you.